Christine Jessup was a nine-year-old girl from Queensville, Ontario. She was born to Janet and Bob De Jessup on November 29, 1974. She was a bit of a tomboy and loved sports, especially baseball. She also had a sensitive side and was a kind girl. She had an older brother named Kenneth. Christine was in the fourth grade at Queensville Public School and was four foot nine inches tall. She weighed only about 40 pounds soaking wet, her family joked. Her mother would later report to the police she had no reason to run away. October 3rd, 1984 was like any other day. At 3.50 p.m., Christine alighted from the school bus and entered her home, picking up the mail on her way. She was home alone as her mum and brother were finishing errands. Her dad was in jail at the time, so was not at home. We know that somewhere between 4 and 4.30 p.m., she went to a convenience store near her house where she purchased bubble gum. That was the last time anyone saw Christine alive. Her mother and brother arrived home at 4.10pm and seeing her bag on the counter along with the newspaper and mail, looked for Christine. When they couldn't find her, they called her friends and began to search the neighbourhood, including a park nearby. No one reported seeing her. Somewhere between 7 and 8pm, her mother called the police. Within just minutes of Janet's phone call, police were searching the area. They also interviewed the Jessup's neighbours and their attention soon turned to the immediate next door neighbour, a man by the name of Guy Paul Moran. Aged 23, other neighbours said to police that he was weird. During a search, a police dog indicated towards Moran's car. A subsequent search inside the car revealed fibres which the Ontario Police Forensic Team reported were from Christine. It wasn't until December 31st, 1985 that Christine's body was discovered in a field nearby to Sunderland, over 30 miles from her home. She was unnaturally posed, lying on her back with her legs spread. She wore both a pullover and turtleneck sweater and a blouse with buttons that were missing, along with two pairs of socks. Her panties were found near her right foot, Found just south of her body were corduroy pants, including a belt and a pair of Nike shoes. An autopsy revealed she had been stabbed to death with multiple blows inflicted. Semen was also found, but DNA testing in criminal cases did not yet exist. Guy Paul Moran was a suspect from early in the case. He lived with his parents and worked at a local furniture store. He also played both saxophone and clarinet in a band. He kept bees as a hobby and other oddity, according to the neighbours. Moran had little contact with his peers and didn't go out to bars or other similar venues. Instead, he spent most of his time on his hobbies. However, he did have a girlfriend and had never before been in any trouble with the police. When he was interviewed, detectives would later testify that they found his actions strange and that he would stare straight ahead and never speak during the interviews. After multiple interviews with police, Moran was arrested and charged with Christine's rape and murder. He went to trial in January 1986. The prosecution's theory of Moran's trial was that he was already an odd man who had simply snapped on the day in question. He raped and then murdered Christine and then disposed of her body miles away in the field. During the trial, technicians reported that the red fibres they had found in his car had come from the sweater Christine had been wearing. Two jailhouse snitches, one of whom had not been identified, testified that Moran had confessed to them while he was in jail awaiting trial. Despite this, Moran was acquitted on February 7, 1986 due to little evidence. In Canada, the prosecution is allowed to appeal for a new trial if the suspect is acquitted, which they did and won the right to another trial in 1987. Moran's second trial was delayed until 1992 due to his own appeals based on the failure of the Crown to disclose exculpatory evidence, amongst other things. In the second trial, the same evidence was presented, but this time the snitches were viewed in a more favourable light by the jury. 
Forensic technicians again testified on the fibres and also that just one hair on a necklace worn by Christine matched Morin's. On July 23, 1992, he was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Classed as a child killer in prison, he was abused and also raped by other inmates, all while his attorney worked to appeal for a third trial. While this appeal was still pending, DNA science progressed to the point it could test the DNA found on Christine's body. It did not match Morin. On January 23, 1995, his appeal was granted and thanks to the DNA report, his conviction was set aside. A direct verdict, one made where the judge decides the jury couldn't possibly reach any other decision, of a full acquittal was entered. After his release, Morin was awarded nearly $1.5 million in compensation. Also, an inquest conducted to discover how his trial went so wrong shone a hard light on the Canadian justice system. It found that the prosecution had withheld from the defence esculpatory evidence, which is evidence that is favourable to the defendant, and usually tends to prove them innocent. Technicians in the lab had also contaminated the samples, but had withheld that fact from the defence. The two snitches had been coached by police, and also received a sentence reduction themselves in return for their testimony. The inquest found that the police had focused in on Morin from the beginning, despite the fact that he had an airtight alibi. Some reports say that the police even did such things as convince Christine's mother to say they had arrived home at 4.35pm instead of 4.10pm, as Morin couldn't have been home earlier than 4.15pm. The Jessops later apologised to Morin. Christine's murderer is still unknown.